writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host, David Allen Lucas, author of science fiction, crime drama, and other insanity, and president of St. Louis Writers Guild. With me today is... Vidor Amos. I am president of Greater St. Louis Sisters in Crime, and I also write Victorian whodunits like Jack the Ripper in St. Louis. And coming in February of 2016, Mayhem at Buffalo Bill's Wild West. I'm Melanie Quilaney, um, author of science fiction, uh, fantasy, and nonfiction. I'm Lee Savage. I'm author of paranormal erotic romance, erotic and poetry, and under the name Carrie Lee Williams, I also have two children's books. Uh, I'm Brad R. Cook. I am the author of The Iron Chronicles. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, it's a steampunk fantasy. I uh, hope you enjoy it. Uh, anyway, Iron Horseman is out there. Please check it out. Uh, love it as much as I do. And uh, coming in November, check out Iron Zulu, uh, the sequel. You can pre-order it now. Excellent. And today we're going to continue with the second half of A Bunch of Rules. This is from IO9, written by Charlie Jane Anders. Ten, rule, ten writing rules we wish more science fiction and fantasy authors would break. And just like all other Right Pack episodes, this is not limited to science fiction and fantasy. So let's continue on. This, to- this next topic, though, is science fiction. And that is no FTL. No faster than light travel. <clears throat> I, this should be a brief one, but I'm going to say this. If that you're writing point. hard science fiction, what do I mean by hard? The Martian just came out. That's a hard sci-fi. Yes. Uh, 2001 Space Odyssey, 2010 Space Odyssey. Anything in that genre, I'm sorry, you, have to, you can't have FTL yet. No. NASA's working on it. You can't do it yet. But, yeah, other science fiction, um, be it... If you want to limit yourself with modern science, science. only, exactly. you can't have faster than light. Right. Or if you, time travel, right? Or yeah, time travel. I mean, you can travel forward, forward in time, forward. like we're doing now. Yeah. <laughs> right now. We just moved. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. Interstellar has taught us that so well. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> well, hey, there's a sequel. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's you, a sequel you can also cool. to Interstellar with Matt Damon again. Good to know. Well, you can also. Okay. I thought he died. <laughs> Matt Damon <laughs> in, in Interstellar. Oh, yeah. Not, in The Martian, no. In Interstellar, I thought he blew up his... and he's just going to come back. Yeah. Come on. Anyway, <laughs> he just stayed there. We Sorry, go on. Way of spending millions of dollars to pick up Matt Damon somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but he's going to do Born in Identity or Born Again too. So the... yeah. Okay, uh, but I was just thinking with the the time travel, you can uh, if you go faster, you're literally moving faster in time relative to the person that's going slower yes. than you. So yes, you can do relative time <coughs> travel that way. Yeah. So yeah, if you have someone traveling very fast, they could theoretically come back and be very much younger than you would everyone else. So uh-huh. can we talk about Star Trek and the real problem <laughs> of all of the Star Trek movies and TV shows? Beam me up that the so people funny. back at Starfleet would age like so crazily compared to like Kirk or Picard. But or that's the because the warp field solves that problem. <laughs> yes. Well, and how is it not just taking time through the distance of space and time? You know who handled stars? that? You know who handled that? Um, oh shoot, I just forgot his name. <laughs> the guy who wrote the original novel, Planet of the Apes. The plan okay. in the Planet of the Apes. Forget the movies. Forget the Charleston. He- Charl- Charles Heston. Oh, but movies. those damn dirty apes. Yes. <laughs> Even though they were good. Um, Boulet. I can't think of his first name now. But I got the last name. Um, the way the novel worked, they the astronauts actually go to another star. They're they're ro- traveling relativistically faster than the speed of light. And they find a they find a planet, it's run by apes. The human and the girlfriend he picks up on the way at the planet. 
they leave that planet at the end. They travel back to Earth, traveling faster than light, relativistically. And they come back and they find out that Earth now is being run by apes and is a constant cycle between apes and humans in an evolutionary track. Is how that really all plays out. So now I ruined the book for you. Yes. I don't think I wanted to read it, Eddie. Uh, yeah. I I, it, it actually, it's actually an interesting read, but we'll talk about that off, off mic. <laughs> but the, the point is, faster than light travel, yes. if you're writing near hard science fiction that's near to this time, you can't mm-hmm. have faster than light travel, unless that's the big change of your novel, and that's the big breakthrough, that right. they figured out a way to do it. But, you know, there are ways to do it, like... Uh, well, theoretical Theoretical ways. ways. I can't just whip around the sun and go back in time. Uh, sorry, yeah. Superman. That was the premise of one of them, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, at least one. No, but I mean, for instance, uh, wormholes are postulated. So if you go from yeah. part, uh, if you go from A to B without passing through the intervening space, you know, you did you go faster than the light? Maybe you just popped out into a parallel universe and popped back into our universe at a different point. You know. Oh, I always think of wormholes as being like tubes you have to fly through. Uh-huh. But is it really just going to be like a sphere I open up around me and then I close it and I'm in a new spot? Well, that's, and that would be closer to the true theory of a wormhole. Yeah. But yeah, it's a good question. So yeah, that, black holes are spherical. Yeah, so. exactly. So that's the whole issue. It's mm-hmm. like how theoretical is your hard sci-fi? <laughs> right. So. However, don't uh, limit yourself because oh. I personally love the warp drives and uh-huh. the jump drives and whatever they're using in Dune. Yeah. <laughs> they fold space. That's it, they're folding space, yes. That's what Quantum Leap used, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. But yes, there are other ways. And, just a sidebar, we had a conversation about this last night in the, um, regarding the first, or the last Star Trek uh, movie. Sorry, cause we just got a text message from Meredith, who is getting ready to call us in a few minutes to join in this conversation. But we were talking about, yeah, they, they could have just made the last Star Trek a lot better by going ahead and kill off Kirk and then do a do a mashup. They had to travel back in time, put him in the Lazarus pitch for Batman. He goes back. <laughs> we're good. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, and we were also oh talking goodness. that we could make it better, like stick him in the cryogen, have him not quite die, stick him in the cryogenics right. uh, thing, and uh, the next movie could be about, you know, finding the cure for Kirk. Would that be head only? That they no, it would be the whole body. No, no oh, just like Noonien Soon was in the whole cryogenics. Okay, whatever. I started this. I need to pull it back. Sorry. <laughs> cryogenics could be an interesting conversation. But anyway. Yes, but that's another day. We need another to move day. on to number seven. Uh, number seven. and Which is... Uh, be, which Got actually, my ire going. Anyway. Thank you. That's mine too, because I'm going <laughs> to say it. I am so glad this show is technically rated PG. Because I rated it that way so we could add in curse words if necessary. And for once, <laughs> this curse word is definitely needed. Number seven, women can't write hard science fiction. Bullshit. Bullshit. Thank you. Bullshit. Yes. Thank you. No, we have a limit per show, so you know. <laughs> yeah. I'll reach it, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, according, you know, according to some society, some aspects of society, Women just don't know how, don't know science, can't possibly write hard science fiction. And I'm going to say it again, bullshit. <laughs> so, or mystery, or, oh, yeah. or anything noir, or hard-hitting at but all. This is becoming more problematic with online, everyone knows about everybody else, but that's why a whole lot of science fiction authors have published with their initials. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not and the thing is, not all of them are female. Some of them just publish their initials, which is why women can do that. And, yes. you know. Not get but, singled out. Mm-hmm. Yes. But the reverse is true in other genres. Like, uh, apparently men can't write romance. Hello. BS. <laughs> there, there, there are. There can't are say bullshit some again. Yeah. yeah. Like uh, Eric Seager with Love Story. I mean, how many millions did that sell? And then a movie. Uh-huh. And there's actually men breaking into writing erotica now. Oh, yeah. That doesn't surprise me. They're writing hardcore erotica, bad boys, and women love to read that. So, mm-hmm. you know. So, if you're a woman out there, or yet a young girl who's looking to write, and hopefully you're of age as you got onto our show, <laughs> um, yes, if you want to write hard sci fi, go for it. All right. Oh, and just so you know, huh. if you know, if you if there's a book, people like it, but they know you're a woman. 
they'll just say it's not hard sci-fi. Even though if the men had written the exact same book, they'll say it's hard sci-fi. That's... Yeah, but that's probably going to change. Eventually. Eventually. We have so many, like... I mean, if you look at, like, you know, a lot of the NASA scientists, a lot of the planetary scientists oh, yeah. and stuff like that, they're all women. Yes. Mm-hmm. I mean, there, there's some kick-ass women in uh, studying the stars and, oh. you know, all this kind of stuff. There is a... And that's a, not going to change. Yeah. They're great engineers. We've got massive astronauts. Yes. We've had this for 20-plus years now. So, to be honest, the notion that women can't write hard sci-fi is yes. probably an antiquated thing going away like the dinosaurs. Yes. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, if you think about it, one of the biggest things in sci-fi right now, it's not necessarily hard sci-fi, but to be honest, it's super hard sci-fi, uh, is Anne Lucky. Yes. With her yeah. trilogy. I mean, she's won every award. She's, you know, got... She made, basically, SFWA change their rules about who they let in uh, because, you know, she basically kicked down all the doors. Uh, so now, what does S- what does that stand for? Science fiction writers, writers of America. Okay. Uh, but yeah, so it's the kind of thing where I, you know, I, I just I, I think we have so many female scientists now, oh, yeah. so many ladies who have grown up their whole lives, and, and probably now even, you know, scientists who are, you know, our age, and I say that as in their thirties and forties, who didn't have anything growing up. So these are the women who are going to write. That amazing hard sci-fi, uh, and push it out, uh-huh. uh, oh. and get it out, so that people oh, okay. have you know hard and sci-fi written by women. I will say I've read I've read quite a bit of hard sci-fi that was written in the fifties and sixties, and it really was hard sci-fi. But some of those people, the story was great, but they couldn't actually write that well. <laughs> it, it sounded yeah. like it was written by an engineer for some strange yeah. reason. Well, and going back to what Brad's saying, we've had a change in <clears throat> science presentation to the public. Um, more recently, Bill Nye, the science guy, who's now in charge of Planetary Society. But that was, if you watch television, he was teaching science. You have Neil deGrasse Tyson. If I'm pronoun- Yes, I, li- I, I love him Devotee from a you. science point of view. Though you did kill Pluto off as a subplanet, he but anyway, do that. well, I will defend Neil. No, it, he we was involved. He was involved, but anyway, where I'm going, I, and right now I can't think of her name to save my life. It is is a Hispanic name, but she is doing the same thing, and she is popular in the science world. And God, I can't, I can't believe I can't think of her name because I'm sorry, ladies. I'm going to say this now. She is one very beautiful, hot, intelligent scientist. It's just point blank. I'm going to say it right there. Yes, I have fetishes for little traces Martin. of those prejudices. Still <laughs> have to watch there. No, it's actually the prejudice. There is yes. Um, any woman can do it. I'm just saying. Even if she's beautiful. That's, that's and that. The intelligent part adds the beauty. <laughs> Yeah, you see, the the uh, problem is uh, you can't remember her name. I know it, it's because no, I can't remember some other names. <laughs> and I, 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 I know I got her name. I just can't pull You're kind of outnumbered here right now. <laughs> I'm going to stop burying yeah. myself. Actually, I'm going to look her up while yes. I'm talking. He's blushing, by the way, everybody. <sighs> anyway, number eight. Magic has to be just a uh, minor part of a fantasy world. Uh, excuse me, Star Wars, mm-hmm. enough said. Yeah. Um, go ahead. What do you guys think about all that? To be honest, I, it, it bugs me. I, I hate the thought, and I get it. You know, we, we've, this, this is a backlash to what was TSR, probably. TSR? Uh, the 70s. It's, not, uh, it's basically the, the publishing company that published all the D&D novels. Um, but they were super heavy. I mean, the classicness of every cheesy sci-fi convention that you can think of, or fantasy convention, I should say, uh, came out of those TSR novels. So I get why we had a backlash to that in the sense of magic had to kind of go underground and become a little bit more subtle, something woven in. Uh, but I don't like that. I think there's... I love the idea that you can bring in magic in every different way from... Uh, the, the people who draw energy in from around them, like benders or something. Uh, or to, uh, you know, the concocters who sit there in their kitchens and mix up jars, mason jars, with spells in them uh, to smash and destroy and release the spell. 
Uh, I love the idea that you can take magic and kind of go almost any direction with it. I, I do like that magic can be an integral part of the world. I mean, if you had these powers, people would use them all the time. Come on. On the other hand, in world building, I've noticed I've been playing D&D, and this is the first campaign I've been in, and there is just so much to learn. And that, I think, is the <laughs> danger of coming into a fantasy novel. If your world is too... I was going to say complicated, but that's not really the problem. If your world is too different from the real world, it takes your reader a long time to figure out how it works, and you can lose your reader that way. So that's that's the danger of that. And you have to make sure that your reader can be along for the ride, even if they don't know all these things about your world, I guess. One of the things about science in the science or magic, I'm throwing both in there. I will say and I think this is where this comes from, is that don't make your book necessarily about the science unless that really is the focus of the book. Let me use an example. I love Star Trek to death, but the second that they have an issue that comes up, they start doing science babble talk, and suddenly by the end of the show they've solved the issue. That's kind of where they're trying to make the science or fantasy stuff ahead. So... I'm going to talk about illusion and magic. Cool. It may be that magic is nothing but illusion, or that the magic, so-called, is simply that we don't understand whether it's an illusion or something else. So I think there is plenty of room for it, and you could explain some of it and leave some of it simply unexplained. Yeah. Why not? Uh, the article actually brings up uh, Game of Thrones. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, be in, in the sense of there is some magic floating around in kind of the fringes of Westeros. Mm -hmm. But in reality, it's very much a world grounded, down in the dirt, you know, he was going for bloody conflict and all that. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I love the idea that it's wow. taken away and it's a little bit of a separation from that. However, I also love the idea of Tolkien mm -hmm. and Gandalf and, you know, the, the notion that he just has to, like, kind of coax the crystal on the top of his staff and suddenly the light appears. Right. You know, I love that sense of getting to play with that. Is it real world, real world based? Uh, if you look at some of the writings of like, you know, T.W. Finley mm -hmm. and the Mayan stuff that she goes into where she starts dealing with crystals and vibrations, mm -hmm. you might believe it's scientifically possible. Uh, but the, the fact is, I think it, I, I don't like the idea of limiting myself. Mm -hmm. No, I would agree. Uh, just joining us now by phone is Meredith Tate. Meredith, Hi. hello. Let me turn up the volume, make sure that you get on the recording. There we go. Say hello again one more time. Hello. That's better. <laughs> I know that's being picked up. We are on number eight right now of the conversation, which is magic has to be just a minor part of a fantasy world. So, Lee, you, you got your fingers up. Yeah, I just want to say, magic can be a big part of the story, but don't lose your characters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If your magic overshadows your characters, and that's what people draw to and feel for, then you're going to lose your readers. You have to balance that. And if you can balance that and make the magic right there with the characters, as long as the characters are just slightly above, I think you'll do fine. I'm going to say real quick, I, I, my explanation a moment ago was not as good as I would want it to be. So let me just throw out two examples of what I was trying to talk about. Babylon 5 and the remake of Battlestar Galactica. Science was very important, but they didn't sit around talking about how to make blasters. I, I know that's not the terms they use. PPGs. They didn't sit around talking about how to make Star Fears or go back in time or anything. It was treated, the science of it was treated like how we live today. How many of us will sit around and talk about how to make a microwave oven? Not like no. that. Brad. Well, I was going to say, and kind of picking back on what Lee was just saying, about uh, using magic in your world. You know, as much as I love magic and want magic around and want to have fun with it and play with it and, you know, use it to open doors or, you know, have fun stuff like that, you should never have it be your plot device. No. Uh, and the reason being is that, you know, just as the deus as machia stuff comes in, uh, unless, of course, you're going to be Luke Skywalker, who's, you know, using the Force to send the, you know... Proton torpedoes uh, down. Proton torpedoes I, into the Death Star. Yes. I have a point. Go for it. Okay. 
So I'm actually going to say something kind of the opposite. And forgive me if it's already said before I get on the phone, but I actually get frustrated if I pick up a book and it's labeled as fantasy and there is literally, it's pretty much in our world and one tiny magical element. Because I'm just like, it's a, yeah, I picked up a fantasy book looking for a fantasy book. If I had wanted some small thing that was different from our world, I would have looked for magical realism. And I actually just had that experience recently with, um, I'm not going to say it's title, but a pretty big YA fantasy book that was marketed as YA fantasy, and it might as well have just been YA historical fiction, because or magical there was only realism? one tiny hint of magic in the very end, and I was like, what? What is this? So I'm going to say that I actually like when a book has a lot of magic in it. Yeah, I would agree. I just want to point out that my area is mystery and you can't use a lot of magic in certain places for sure because people want answers and they want justice in mystery and especially they want justice in wrapping up the end of it. You cannot mm -hmm. by magic get a locked mystery, locked room mystery solved. You cannot do it. It yeah. is cheating your audience in a very big way and it simply won't do in mystery. Uh, sorry, Harry Dresden. <laughs> yeah. there, Harry Dresden is the is the exception, e exception to that rule. Yeah, but so totally it's an exception because it's not like he just uses magic to solve every crime no, he walks up exactly. to. exactly. He uses magic like a detective As a tool. Use, uses his forensics tools. Exactly. You know? So instead of having to like bring down the forensics team to pull up that print, he just uses magic to detect the print. Exactly. You know? A good example, I'm glad you said forensics because I was going to jump in here, throwing in the science again. If you have a forensics team in a mystery, unless they are important to the story, I don't know why you would have a conversation about it. This is how I detected DNA, by running the blah, 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 blah. Yes. Yeah. Can we talk it. about the fact that CSI is basically magic? Okay. <laughs> uh, um, okay, I've said this before. I've said this before. CSI is good. I liked CSI for the first couple of seasons. Oh, who doesn't love all 10 or 15 CSIs? But, but, it is unrealistic. Mm -hmm. um, first off, you you nice little lab rats. You stay in oh, the lab. What? You you don't go around. You those there are some that go on on site at the crime scene, but you don't go around interrogating or interviewing. The Emmy is the one who shoots the killer in the end. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. Oh, I know. Oh, I know. I Emmy, mean, shoot him. him. Okay. I know what, yeah. You know. No, doing I, your own work. Yes. I, I will say, uh, getting back to where it might be appropriate to have fantasy being a minor part of the story, and I agree with Meredith's point that it shouldn't actually be marketed as fantasy for this way. But, for instance, I've read some ghost stories, or rather, they weren't ghost stories. There were stories that had ghosts in them. Okay. And they were really a mystery or a romance or something else. Mm -hmm. And there was a ghost, and the ghost was probably probably real and not in just everybody's imagination. So, in that way, it was fantasy. But I wouldn't. It shouldn't be marketed as a fantasy. This should be marketed in the romance mm. section, or marketed in the mystery section, and then maybe on the book jacket, maybe mention it, maybe not. Maybe like a touch of paranormal or something. Yeah, I would say maybe a touch of paranormal because, like, mm. technically vampires can be considered fantasy, but I don't mark it as fantasy. I mark it as paranormal. Yeah, right. because. That is where that fits into better. And then yep. what you do is you go and you tag your book. So if people are searching, but you can the say The thing is, if over. the ghost is just like, for instance, if you're a researcher researching the history of this house and a possible ghost that's haunting it, unless, the, unless this is a poltergeist type thing, I wouldn't even necessarily market that as paranormal. These shelving mm -hmm. decisions are all about money. Yeah. Yes. Whatever is popular at the moment. It doesn't mm -hmm. really have anything to do with what the book actually is. Unless somebody yeah. lied to me, which is always a distinct possibility, the idea of genre really is new. It came out sometime around the 70s, maybe a little before that. It was about how to get booksellers to be able to sell books. Know where to put you on the shelf. That's how it started. Mm. Okay. Next one is no present tense. Oh, oh. Can I say something? G uh, yeah, go ahead. I was about to, but go for it. What was? Go for it. Okay. So, my favorite way to read books is present tense. And I actually, and this is a personal preference, but I find it puts me more into the action. And I also sometimes find past tense, again, personal preference, to be a spoiler. Because whoever the narrator is, we know that they're still alive at the end of the book. 
because they're talking in past tense. <laughs> they survived everything in there. So for me, when I'm reading a high stakes action sub story, like I remember in the Hunger Games, the fact that it was present tense really helped me connect to the character in the situation and it made it more high stakes for me. But, um, so I guess what I would say is just, um, I don't like the whole thing that present tense is frowned upon now because for me, I prefer it, but I know other people. I know that that was a big complaint about the Hunger Games for some, but I feel like people should do whatever fits best for their story, and if it's present tense, then they should do that. I will say, though, in counter argument to you, only minor is I've read one. I can't. I talked about it on the show. I can't remember which one it was that was written in present tense, and it took me a while to get into it because it just kept knocking me out with the with tense change. But I probably once you, I understand what you're saying, and once you are used to it. It can add to the story. Yeah. Uh, I actually agree with Meredith. I actually am a fan of uh, Present Tense. I don't know if I'd want to read it with every book I you know, pick up or anything like that, but I do enjoy it, partly because it is a departure. Uh, however, it is something, if someone is out there trying to write Present Tense, uh, to be very careful about, because uh, it, it is incredibly easy to flip-flop and switch and get screwed up in it and all that kind of fun stuff. But if you can read a really good book that's in Present Tense, Hunger Games, one of them, uh, they're, they're Who's actually... talking, sir? Hmm? Say that again. Who's talking? That was Brad. Oh, hi, Brad. Sorry, I didn't hey. your voice. Sorry, continue. No worries. <laughs> but yeah, so the point being is that, uh, you know, I, I think present tense has its place. My very first book I ever wrote was in present tense because I thought I was being edgy and cool. Uh, and I got yelled at by everyone under the sun. And what, who knows, but five years later, present tense is the hottest thing in the industry. It's... It's kind of funny that you said that. Um, when I did have a company looking at uh, Shadows of My Past, that was one other than my violence that they wanted me to tone down. They also wanted me to switch it completely into present tense. But they gave me, and they were like, here's some article clips on how to do this. And I was like, what? <laughs> You're mm -hmm. going to completely change my voice? And I, I may have looked into it more had it not been that they wanted to cut other elements out, but I was like, I actually had a request for that, and I thought that was strange, but. I have an absolute aversion <laughs> to present tense. I cannot stand it, because any time I start to read it, I see a teenage girl flipping her hair and saying, oh, you know, and I, put, and I go, oh, you know. <laughs> um. Uh. If you guys, sometimes I really wish we did have video. <laughs> that was perfect. Go on. I, I will say, uh, present tense, there are ways to do it badly, but if you do it really well, it has some uses. Um, for example, if you're, it puts you more, more or less right there in the story, but it also makes it very convenient if there are flashbacks, because it makes it immediately obvious when the flashback is, because then the flashback can be in past tense, mm -hmm. because this happened before. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay, what's our next one? My, my Number phone. 10. Oh, no. no unsympathetic characters. Ooh. Oh, okay. What? No I, 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 who's pure evil. Yeah. Yes. I, I, have, I write unsympathetic characters, but they are my bad guys, and you're not supposed to like them. You're supposed to go, yes, they got their justice I, in the end. I don't understand the, the rule. I'm saying there should not be any yeah, let, me, let, let me Let me read the thing. Yeah, late, lately, well, what? just throwing it out. Lately, yeah. you're supposed to not have the pure evil bad guy. You're supposed to have the bad oh, guy supposed to be who is the I hero of their it. own story. You can yeah. still do that and still be evil. Okay, <laughs> go ahead, read. This is, this is what was written on the article. It's certainly true that if you're going to have a main character who's, totally, who's a total bastard, you're going to have to work harder to win over the reader. A likable character is just obviously easier for readers to get bored with. On That's board true. with. On board with. I'm sorry. <laughs> or maybe that was, I, I, that, that was a Freudian yeah. slip. Yeah. I'm <laughs> sorry, that was a Freudian slip because I almost said, yes, hello, Superman, right after that word. Um, but... Okay, but at the same time, feeling constrained to make your protagonist or all your major characters as sympathetic as possible can put a straitjacket on your writing, and that's true. If you, it, um, you know, if you don't, how do you make a killer who wants to commit genocide? Genocide. Genocide. Okay. Genocide. Genocide. <laughs> Damn it. I'm going to genocide this. 
Wow, this is what I get for talking earlier about something else. Anyway, <laughs> that accent came out. Uh, genocide. Um, how do you make him sympathetic? Why should you make oh. him sympathetic? Okay. Can I say something? Yes. yes you may. Uh, I, I never know because I can't put my fingers out. Um, okay. <laughs> that, that's funny so, if you do have them, just in case. So, an example that I would give here is in the Harry Potter book, uh, which is always the example I provide on the show. But one of the reasons why I found the villains in Harry Potter so compelling is because like, even though their opinions and their views were so wrong, I could see how they came to those views given their situation. And I really liked that because if a character is just evil for no reason and they just evil because they want to be evil and they just like being evil, like, they're like, that makes no sense. Like, where, what are your motivations? What are your beliefs? Why do you feel the way you do? And in Harry Potter, we learn about Voldemort's past. We learn a little bit about Bellatrix, about Snape, and there's so like Voldemort is evil, but we know why. We know how he got that way. And but Snape not is so morally gray. He's later. such a like yeah. such an intriguing character that he really compelled me to learn more about him. Whereas if he was just one way or the other, good or bad, I think I would have just been like, oh, yeah, I'm like, that's okay, moving on. But I, the fact that they're morally gray, I feel like it's so compelling to me. And I would agree. However, what we can end up with is the Darth Vader effect. Yes. Which is where you take the scariest villain in the history of cinema, and you turn him into a little boy, and then you turn him into a whiny little teenager, and then finally you turn him into a guy who starts killing everybody, but by that point, we're just sick and tired of it, and we want him to get into the damn suit. (laughs) So, as much as I love the sympathetic bad guy, you know, Darth Vader is a little bit less now because of, you know whiny Padme wanting, you know, Anakin, so... But I, I will say, but what about just the original trilogy, episodes four, five, and six, you know, at the end, Vader was redeemed and yeah. became Anakin again, and that made him sympathetic. Yes, and that was actually quite awesome. Yeah. Uh, and in, you know, in Iron Horseman, I have a super villain who's half bronze, uh, and you just, he's an evil dude throughout the whole first part of the book. However, in book two, you will find out why he is an evil bastard, why he hates the world as much as he does, and all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, and I do not plan to redeem him in three, but in three you'll get to learn kind of why everything in the world's going on. So I think you need that kind of progression in a story, and I think showing the, sympath- the sympathetic side of your super evil villain can be a wonderful thing to do as the story progresses, but I think you have to walk that fine line of not making him too sympathetic, and turning him into whiny Anakin. Yeah, I mean, I'll, let me take one of the most, should be unsympathetic, bad guys in our history, in the real world. Adolf Hitler. Um, point blank. Every reason to hate him. But yet he was a dog lover. He loved his little dog. Still doggies. doesn't make me like him. Doesn't make me like him either. But He, he liked least, art, still doesn't make me like yeah. him. Um, he was a beautiful he liked kids, artist, same thing. Yeah. No, I still want to go back in time, and yes, I would shoot him. I, but anyway, what I want to say is, if you can, the trick is get you know, avoid the, the mustache twirling. twist, <laughs> yeah, and make them look human. Don't need to make them look sympathetic. Let's go to the world of mystery for a moment, and go for one it. of the greatest villains of all time, Moriarty. Oh, and he was yeah. never a nice guy, frankly. No. Yeah. So no, I don't but he was he was intri- to be. he was yeah. never no. sympathetic, but he was intriguing, and you did wonder right. what made him that right. way. Exactly, but he's not sympathetic. Oh yeah. no, not I, at all. I think it's all whether you're true to your story. Like in Angel of Death, um, one of my bad guys, I never give him a reason why he's bad. He's a vampire. Mm-hmm. He's a villain. He's just bad. Mm-hmm. And then when he gets his, you're like, yes, you don't feel bad for him. You're like, yay, justice. <coughs> Whereas in um, Shadows of My Past, I have the serial killer, and he starts out bad, but you do find out Mm -hmm. what makes him turn and kind of lose his mind a little bit into this twisted sense that he thinks he's killing all this evil when it's just normal people that have psychic abilities. Mm -hmm. And then you feel a little sympathy, but not enough that it's like when he gets his that you're like, oh, he should have been saved. Really, ultimately, what I'm hearing from everybody is the trick is the important thing is that you don't have to make a sympathetic character. 
You can make him unsympathetic. The trick is not to make him a cardboard character. And I'm going to throw out there, I know poor Fedora's going to hit me. <laughs> well, she can't. She's at a distance, but still. I'm going to throw out my old, fas- my old favorite whipping boy on this, and that is John Steinbeck with the Grapes of Wrath. The good guys were very well filled out characters, and the bad guys who were the bangs and so forth were cardboard. And that's really what, for me and for a lot of others, kind of made the story not workable. And that's what you're saying. Mm-hmm. If I'm hearing anybody disagree, no. the idea is make the character non cardboard. Now, I will say that in a lot of World War II movies, like the traditional ones, not the ones that made recently, but mm-hmm. the ones that were made much sooner after the war, the bad guys were kind of cardboard. It was the winning of the good guys, that was the point, and the bad guys were just evil because yeah. they were the bad guys. They were that's propaganda. a bit of propaganda. Mm-hmm. Yes. Propaganda will always do that. Yeah, but I, that's, I think that's the point. Fine. When you have the bad guys that are just the bad guys, it feels like propaganda. Yeah, this is true. And I think the other... What? Go, Go ahead. Go for it. Meredith? Yeah. What are you going to say? Uh, I don't know. I wanted to make another point. It's like, so hard for me because I can't tell if somebody's done speaking because I can't see everybody. Oh, that was Melanie. Okay. okay. Um, we'll have to get a Can I talk? Can I say something? Yes. Yes. Okay, sorry. I just, before, before we finish the topic, I just wanted to bring up Gone Girl um, because that's a book that's in dual perspective and both characters are so morally gray and it's not even clear who's the protagonist and who's the antagonist until the end. But even though both characters were so unlikable, I mean, that book was a huge success. Like, everybody wanted to know more about them. I think it's that you don't need to worry about making sympathetic or unsympathetic. Make them intriguing and make them complex and make them a character that people want to know more about. Exactly. And, Meredith, just because you were a little bit unclear at the beginning, you were talking about Gone Girls. And I don't remember. Gone Gone Girl. Girl. Sorry, Gone Girl. Sorry. I don't remember the author of that one, but you're right. And Julian Flynn. Julian who? Flynn. 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 Julian Flynn. And yeah, it's it's a fascinating read and yeah, you're yeah, but part of the reason why it became a success is because of the ambiguity. Both characters are so un- unlikable. I mean you don't like either character. Oh, forget about either. Book. You don't really like any character in that book. That, that might be true, but between the <laughs> two main characters, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, neither one of them is a very good person, neither one of them is sympathetic, you really kind of enjoy that both of them get it in the end. Uh, I have no idea why they got remarried or whatever, but yeah. that was weird. Okay. Anything else? Okay, now I want to ask a question, and this I'm also going to ask to our listeners. I'm going to ask that you post on Facebook or tweet to us or, um, I guess that's the only way, or at least leave a comment on Blog Talk Radio's, the show's comment f- field. What are some of the other things that you see writers doing that you wish they would, other rules are following, that you wish they would break? Does anybody have one? And right off the bat. Yeah, the Hollywood ending. The happy ending. Uh, yeah. Because while uh, the movie industry seems to think you've got to have it, some of the best or at least most famous movies of all time didn't have it. The ending of Gone with the Wind is ambiguous at the best as he takes off and she just says she's going to think about things tomorrow. You know, I'll think about that later. So that it seems to me that we need more flexibility in what kind of ending is acceptable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm going to throw two examples, and then I'm going to let either Meredith or Brad go next. Two examples of what uh, I, I feel that fall right into what you said. One book, Charles Dickens, Tale of Two Cities. The guy is sacrificing himself in the end. He doesn't have a happy ending. I was going to think, oh, yes, I saved the person who I, wa- who I loved. Okay. Second one, this one's a Broadway show, Miss Saigon. If you haven't seen it, um, let's just say there's a suicide at the end. Right? Well, kind of piggybacking on what Fedora said, what irritates me is the simple Hollywood plotline that now every book has to follow as yes. well. We can't tell a story that doesn't have a beginning, a middle, a black moment, and a climax. Uh-huh. And heaven forbid you deviate from that structure whatsoever. And I'm even talking about taking your climax and stretching it out 
taking your black moment and you know maybe even having it be for a you know a segment of time you know like in books it used to be you could explore you could have fun you could get crazy and then when they made the movie they would trim it down to that simplest storyline possible uh but now we've kind of moved into an era where people expect this kind of storytelling. What is the name of the the book? It has cat in the title that explains that format. Um, something, Save the cat. S- Save the cat. Yeah, that's yes. it. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I wish we'd, we'd break out from the basic roller coaster story structure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so break out from story structure of a happy ending, shall we say, or away from Hollywood. What's another one? Um, this, not so much with movies, but with books. For a while, it was plot doesn't matter. I actually think plot does matter. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I would also throw out that I I would like to see the, you know, the continuation of the kick-ass warrior women, because I enjoy them. Uh, But I would like to see them mold out of the, you know, kind of sense of either it's coming from a sense of rebellion or, you know, it's coming from a sense of fighting back against something and, and just the ability to be. Um, I, I'd love to see more intelligence thrown into some of these action stars as well. Uh, we tend to like the dumb action hero. Um, I, I would really, and I'm talking male, female. I yeah. mean, it doesn't matter which side you go to, but I would love to see more of that nuance come into an action character uh, as opposed to just, you know, punch them in the face and move on. Not that yeah, I mind. Titan. This yeah. is, no, this is a different thing. Okay, I'm going to jump on this because he made me think of it. And it's one thing which I wish would go away. It's an entire list. So I'm going to just say, Google this. Women in refrigerators. We've talked about that before on this yes, show. We have talked about this on the show. Um, a movie that used it recently, The Equalizer. I did love the movie. Don't get me wrong. It was a kick-ass movie. I loved Denzel Washington in it. But the one thing that bothered me is what got him started was a woman in refrigerator situation. Yes. Uh, the, the girl was never in a refrigerator. If you go and read the read what I'm talking about, you'll understand what I'm saying. On an entirely different track. Entirely different track. <laughs> I wish that Kathleen were here because I think she would want to talk about this. Uh-huh. And it is the treatment of gays and lesbians. Yes. yes. Most especially that they have to either be in the sack or hating each other or some weird thing like that. I think it's possible for gays to be friends with other gays and not f- excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. We've already, we've already, we've already gone there. Oh, we have gone wow, there. Wow, wow. <laughs> she is turning red. No, I'm not the one red. No, no. Um, I completely yeah. agree. I mean, I it's the I notion also. <laughs> no. We had the whole Harry Met yeah. Sally thing where guys yeah. and girls can't be friends without getting it on. Yeah. You know, I, I think it's the same thing. You don't have to have, you know, every relationship doesn't have to be bound around these kind of, you know, what are archaic conventions. Um, to be honest, you can move forward with anything. I would love to see more diversity. Mm-hmm. And I don't just mean diversity in terms of gender or sexual orientation or anything like that. I mean in the characters that we show. I mean, if you think about it, we show all the same characters. We show the slut. We show the prude. We show, you know, the jock. We, I mean, show we the basically archi- the show the, the bre- Yeah, we show the breakfast club. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we pull <laughs> yeah. from those and move them around, the popular person, you know, mm-hmm. the, the nerd and all that kind of stuff. And we just move those archetypes around, but we keep them very much in that set stereotype. I would mm-hmm. love to see more nuance. Agreed. Can I say something about that? Yes, you may. <laughs> Jump on. Um, well, I was just saying, I, I, I agree with Brad in that I almost exclusively read YA, and I have yet to come across a main character, basically any character, that I feel like fits with my high school experience, which was I had a ton of friends, and I was a band geek, and I did art, and that was what I did. And I wasn't popular, I wasn't unpopular, I wasn't bullied, and I feel like I still haven't, because all these characters are these extreme archetypes, a lot of times in YA, I find that I struggle to find one who even represents my experience, or I'm sure other people who've had similar experiences in mind feel the same way. Well, let's admit it. Working of archetypes makes it easier to write because you've already got something that's form-fitted. You just have to figure out how, how, how to change it just a and little bit. you're matching better. reader expectations. You're yeah. matching reader expectations, which, if you want your book to sell, yes, you want reader expectations, but that does not mean you sit there and just keep throwing the same baseball. You've got to hit it out of the park, or at least try to. Yeah, there's some authors that they're really good at writing, but if you if they've written enough and you keep reading, it's like, oh, they write the same book. They, they write the same six books over and over again. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to keep my mouth shut about one that's about to, that is in the process of doing that. 
Yeah. I'm just, I'm not going to say anything. But else. some of these authors, they're so good at writing, it's like, oh, could you please just team up with someone and uh, have them give you a better plot, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> they yeah. have a formula that works, like if Janet Ivanovich keeps writing the same book. Yeah. And, yeah, but Stars. I love them anyway because uh, they're just fun mm-hmm. and quick mm-hmm. read and you blast through it and it's escape. Yeah, yeah a Nicholas Sparks novel has a set kind of arc to it and to be honest, it kind of has to have that arc. Uh-huh. I, as much as I would love to be able to screw around with it or anything like that, they've still got to meet, have some sort of low moment where they break up. Oh no, he's bad, she's bad, whatever. They get back together and then they're happily ever after. I mean, you know, it's an arc that's kind of there. I was reading a mystery book, the same one that my mom had already read, and she was asking me where it was. I said, well, I haven't gotten to the second murder yet. No, I hadn't read that. She didn't spoil it for me, but I knew there was another murder mm-hmm. coming. <laughs> Well, it's a good mystery novel. There should definitely be another murder coming. Well, and I don't care what point of the book you're in, there should be another murder coming. I've always blamed myself for this. I ruined my love for a certain mystery author who is, more, who is modern. I almost said his name or not. Because I studied the same... If, if he did not study the same author that I'm about to say, that I'm going to throw out there, and he's still my favorite, one of my favorites, if he did not study this plot mechanism but he, that Earl Stanley Gardner followed, I'm shocked because I could follow every single novel that he had up till I got tired of reading them. Because I could say, okay, yes, and now this is point one, point two, all the way up to point nine. And I will say there is yeah. something to the formula that works. There is. I mean, if There's you think about all the, like, Philip Marlowe, you know, kind of, yeah. uh, you know, detective novels, they all follow the exact same format. Client shows up, Client, you know, puts forth mm-hmm. offer, he rejects said offer, you mm-hmm. know, gets somehow embroiled into said, you know, dete- or said case, mm-hmm. then takes case, solves case. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure, it, yeah, it's, it's you know, and mm-hmm. if you get a formula that works, I mean, this is why TV shows do so well. This is why Quantum Leap was on for, like, mm-hmm. ever and ever and <laughs> ever. Because, you know, guy jumps in, has no idea what to do, must figure out what to do, solves problems, jumps out. Right. You know, so when you Which have a very formula often that works. was a romantic thing. Yeah. Yeah, but ultimately, what we're saying is, at least I think what we're really trying to say is, a don't make it just a character focused story. You know, plot's important, but don't just focus on the plot either. Make the characters interesting. Mm-hmm. If you are going to use a, an archetype, and believe me, they're all out there. Um, I don't care if you do the idea of the um, Norse mythology. Oh, sorry, not Norse, Greek mythology idea. Where, for example, Spock is Apollo. He has no real emotions. And we lost Meredith. Um, But if you do that, then that's one thing. But add to the character. How how, how can you have that archetype and break it out past that? Any others? Yeah, I would actually throw out... um, And this goes mostly to the genre stuff. Um, But I, I would love to, you know, to see more craziness. Um, we've seen lightsabers, blaster pistols, um, shields, and, you know, like, you know, I, I can't even count all the sci-fi tropes, uh, that we have run into that are all the same. Um, yet, you know, when's the last time anybody else whipped out a, uh, a probability drive? <laughs> you know, and I'm not saying every author can just create something that's totally unique mm-hmm. and awesome and, you know, out there. But, you know, Doctor Who walks around with a screwdriver. He doesn't walk around with a Not pistol anymore. strapped to his side. True. <laughs> but the point being is that, you know, having characters that are different, having them have something unique uh, is, you know, kind of better, I think, than just having the standard, uh, and I'll throw myself under the bus with this one, guy carrying a lightning cannon. <laughs> I so, like that concept. Yeah, it's just kind of a trope in steampunk that everyone's overused, including me. So, well, I love what you're talking about there, Brad, and would add to it that. Uh, now I totally forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> Well, actually, you made me think of something in terms of of mystery novels and stuff like that, not always having the weapon be a gun or a knife or something like that. Um, You know, know, gunshots are great, but, you know, a good wrench to the head every (laughs) once in a while. Hi, Hill. I remember now. (laughs) It was that we seem to see the same science fiction idea over and over again. They Mm -hmm. go off somewhere and fight bugs. 
Yes. And why can't some of the problems, at least, be nicer kinds of problems? My favorite Star Trek episode ever was the trouble with Triffitt. <laughs> Tribbles. Tribbles. Tribbles, I'm sorry. Tribbles, which were cute little buddy tail sort of things. Yes. And, but they had a problem, and the problem was that they reproduced too often <laughs> and too much and filled up the entire spaceship with Tribbles. Yes. And I found that a most a much more fun kind of problem oh, for them totally to deal agree. with than just fighting bugs in space. Yes, mm. I, I would love to see more humor in some novels, yeah. too. Uh-huh. And not just, you know, like, you know, even like the bug fighting movies or something like that. Not just having the guy make some, sh- you know, snarky comment before he blows the bug's head off. <laughs> but, you know, can't I have a planet of cat people or something like that running around who are, you know, getting crazy or having chasing their hairballs or something? <laughs> like there actually used to be a series out that were cat people, but the, 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 company, the company went under and no more books came out because when they went under, they had her whole series mm. in lock, stock, and barrel, and she couldn't put out any more of the books. But something like the Lego movie, mm-hmm. you know, which is, you know, it's a great movie. I, I love it. It's kind of fun. But the point is, is that in that movie, they throw convention to, you know, straight out the window, going from everything from the Dupo blocks, you know, up to, like, you know, modern day, where they have all the crazy little blocks that can make, you know, anything under the sun. Um, but nothing in that is is standard. Uh, everything is kind of unique and twisted and stuff like that, and it ended up being a great thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think I would love to see more of that. Mm. However, I'm also a Star Wars geek, and I'm loving the fact that Seven's about to come out, and I'm going to get new lightsabers and <laughs> new shields <laughs> and new Jedi running around. And so. he he knows he wants me to buy one of those lightsabers so that he can go out there. <laughs> we can go out there and start doing more <laughs> sword demonstrations. But yeah, so the point being is that you know as much as I. I, I'm kind of advocating for less convention. I do see the point of it. I do see why mm-hmm. there's out there. And, you know, Star Wars invented the lightsaber. So. No, I, I, no w- I disagree. They didn't invent it. Okay. The laser they, they, sword, no, no, but no, they, no. They, they, they popularized, popularized it. Um, now, let's see if I forgot what I and was about to say. Oh, the, um, the bumpy head aliens. Now, especially with CGI, we no longer have to make in books, this was never an issue. With movies, with technology, it's not. Re- it shouldn't be an issue. But you do not have to have intelligent aliens be humanoid. No. And uh, I understand for a TV series made in the '60s why most of the aliens had to look basically like humans wearing a funny costume. Yeah. But That's now, budget issues. Yes. Yeah. But now we can do, especially in books. But even in movies now, we can have aliens that actually look like aliens, and they don't have to look like bugs either. But you know, just. They don't need two hands. They don't need two feet. Can we get butterfly people? Well, yeah, I'm just going to start throwing good. out odd people. <laughs> well, I've had this up on my personal Facebook page not that long ago. It's an insect, about the si- almost the size of my hand. At least that's the way it looked. But it's actually a leaf. It looks like a leaf. Why okay. can't that? I mean, it, it, I mean, if, it's still a bug. But if you look at the evolution here, if it's occurred on on this earth, there are so many different, different, different types of creatures out there. Why wouldn't there be others in different different mm-hmm. environments? My the favorite alien that I've created that I'm sure isn't unique looks much more like a uh, octopus. It has six legs than. Um, there was one of those that served on the cartoon version of Star Trek. Yeah. No, uh, the Edon. Yes, the three le- three arm three legs. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Kind of baldish blue. If I remember right. I think it was orange. It could be orange. I, I, don't, <laughs> remember, I don't remember the color, but yes. Yeah, I don't remember either. By the way, it, a... sidebar, do look up Star Trek, the animated series. Oh, that was such good stuff. Yes, it is cheesy, but oh, yes, yeah, it's worth it. Okay, anything, any other rules before we go? Any other rules you'd like to see shattered from time to time? Hmm. I would say the, 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 the alpha, beta male, alpha, beta female thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd like to see a little bit more nuance there, but to be honest, I don't know if that's necessarily going to happen because, you know, betas don't tend to run out and go on adventures. So yeah, Maybe you true. can have an Arthur Dent type hero. You know, he keeps you getting could. pulled along. Yeah, that, yeah. That's, that's the way of doing it. But, yeah. you know. Maybe we need some Delta heroes or something there you further go. down the yeah. Greek <laughs> alphabet. Exactly. Huh? Can I get an Omega hero? I'm not certain what that would be. But. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, not necessarily. There was actually a story that had to do with a wolf pack, and there was an Omega wolf, and I forget what that meant. Yeah. But 
overall, mm-hmm. though, I guess the ultimate thing is the rules do exist for a reason. Learn them. Understand them. And know but, when you're breaking them? But break them intelligently. Don't feel, don't fear breaking them. Break them, but do it intelligently. Sounds good. And on that mm-hmm. note, we will catch you next week on Right Pack Radio. Have a great week writing. See you next time.